we're having a meeting upstairs. So it's all good. It's all good. It's all oh, good. Well. I didn't record all of the stuff that you and I talked about. As oh, well. no, because we, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll get quite into it. We really don't need that. <laughs> yeah, they don't need to know that knowledge. No. Yeah. We're discussing uh, surgeries. <laughs> when you, Sean, when you do that uh, print on a sublimated shirt, yeah. your underlay and the top color have to match up perfectly. Okay. If that top color touches the, uh, subli the uh, sublimated garment, it'll change color. Got it. Okay. So, one piece of artwork for a two-color job. Now, Sean, I know, I know of you. I've not spoken to you before. What is your company? What's your primary uh, customer base and products? Um, we're probably 70% apparel. Okay. We do embroidery and screen printing in-house. Um, got another six-head Baradin coming in January. Okay. Nice. Nice. Um, now, we just got to figure out how to get it in there. <laughs> oh well that's why they make forklifts yeah no yeah. i mean right where through the, the front door where they're gonna put it this is where they're gonna put it um but uh our primary um is business to business we do our, our school stuff is starting to pick back up i mean that that when that good lord when that dropped off um it dropped off hard and it dropped off long right? yeah yeah we, we took a dip um really we literally from may may of last year uh it just dried up for about three four months so what we did we switched into sanitizer so the first thing i did was i shipped uh about uh probably about sixty thousand four ounce bottles of sanitizer to everybody i knew so i was sending them cases no charge we just sent them out we, we got we, i was able to get some isopropyl and I just switched, you know, switched over two tanks and we just started making sanitizer. I made a, you know, quickly put together a piston filler out of a couple of pneumatic cylinders and some valving and were able to fill these. We could fill them about every 10 seconds. We could fill a four ounce and I just gave it away. I mean, um, you know, I think I got one of the old bottles here. You can't even see it. It just basically just had a we kept we had a, oops, background. It had a we care on the label uh, hand clear. And, we just, and we just sent it as a sanitizer and then uh, we were asking for it people asked us if we could sell it so we produced a um a four ounce and a 12 ounce and we shipped two hundred thousand units and we were paper labeling <laughs> and so it was getting really time consuming so i committed to uh, fifty thousand uh two color screen printed um four ounce bottles and they took about five weeks i was able to get bottles and they arrived and the day they arrived was the last day i got an order for sanitizer so i had fifty thousand spring printed bottles sitting in a container uh unfilled so and then business just took off and for the first six months it was fantastic because we could just we were just shipping products shipping products shipping. and then the the supply chain started to hit us and uh uh, everything from raw materials to containers and pricing so we're we've got more business than we've probably ever had and we're able to ship about 50 percent of it right now and we're allocating to our customers because we want to spread it around to everybody so so what is um uh, what's techmar's largest product um we have two product lines so they, they kind of go side by side 50 50 the the um the spot cleaning fluids and you know the the for removing the plaster soles and the uh, water some of the water based inks so from you know cured inks so that's was our bread and butter probably I got started in uh, and then uh, the we are now number one worldwide on pallet adhesives on water based pallet adhesive technology we ship all over the world we ship you know thousands of gallons a month of, of adhesive and uh, and we have five different adhesives and each one is we're not just like some companies set, tend to package the same product but just different labels different flavors we we actually have genuinely different products we have a, our standard adhesive is our tb10 which is probably 80 percent of our adhesive sales and then we have uh for performance fabrics for the the nike legend and those type of uh, siliconized performance fabrics we have that adhesive we make a version for nike that's compliant with their uh, their protocol for the uh uh, your marine pollutants we make a uh, direct apply which is similar to tv10 that's 
in that 80%, which is a thicker high viscosity, 65% solid adhesive that they can spread directly on the palate, but it thins out super thin. And then we also make a starch adhesive that goes in inside the shirts when they're doing all over printing to keep the shirts together, but then it just dissipates when they pop the shirt open. And if there's any residual, it washes out. So, so, and then we make a lot of equipment. We make all the application equipment. We make adhesive applicators. We make um, spot cleaning guns, cleaning stations. Uh, we were the people that invented the uh, cool down station that goes after the flash gear. So our quick call was the original cool down station that would spray the siliconized water the mist, of, the mist of water on the hot shirt. So you don't have to have a cool down station on your press. You can go flash print because you put this in between and it lowers the temperature of the shirt by 80 to 90 degrees. The water dis disappears immediately from the heat in the shirt and the microscopic amount of silicone will build up underneath the subsequent screens and stop the screen snap. It makes the motion last longer. So the cool down station was our, um, you know, and then a couple of companies made their versions of it. Um, one I've of them, never one, heard of that. You never heard of a cool down station? No, it's been just like gone out. Yeah, gone out long enough. Yeah, go on our website. Um, it's it's Techmar, my company, T-E-K-M-A-R-L-T-D, techmarlimited.com. And you'll um, um, just go to specialized equipment and you'll see the quick call. And it's it's just a great unit because it just fits in. It's got a, a long arm and it fits in between the between, the, stations. the between stations. And there's an indexing sensor that senses the palette. And it just sprays a as the pallet's passing, it sprays just a super fine mist of air and uh, atomized water and silicone, which causes it has a cooling effect on the surface of the shirt. So the you can go straight, you can go uh, print print. You don't have to um, flash print straight away. You don't have to have a loser. You know, you figure you buy a ten color press, right? So you spend uh, what's Charlie? What's a ten color automatic press cost these days? Yeah, over a hundred grand. Uh, okay, uh, so let's let's just uh, let's say hundred grand, right? So that's that's ten thousand dollars a head, right? And you got some, and you got some other. They got put two flashes on there. They're down to six colors. So they've got twenty thousand dollars worth of that press. They're not using. <laughs> this kind of crazy. So, uh, but putting a cool down station in, they can they can print eight colors with two flashes or nine colors with one flash if they want to. So it's uh, it's uh, definitely a uh, advantage for people. And you know, and also anybody that's doing embellishing, um, uh, they're doing foiling, they're doing glitter. Right it just stops everything from sticking to the screens and it keeps everything, you know, stops. So it's, it, just, it improves the performance of any uh, any flash operation. So. so where do I go when I'm on the website? Uh, special to products, specialty equipment. Okay. Um, I might have to shadow you on this and do it myself. Hang on. Uh, make sure I get you to the right place. I'm going for... Yeah, there's one on the... Uh, we had a problem with our website. I hope this this is our products, uh, specialized equipment. And if you got specialized equipment, there's the uh, quick call pallet cool down system, third third one over. Oh, okay. There it is, right there. And we supply the concentrated silicone. One one quarter silicone concentrate makes five gallons, and that will last you three months, depending on how much you're running. It's a super fine mist, but it's the if you look, you'll see a black bar that sticks on the other side of the spray gun and that black bar is an air curtain. So you, you can assemble that depending on the rotation of your press, you can go left or right. It puts an air curtain down and stops any migration into the next screen. So it kind of protects any spray from going over. Um, super reliable, so I mean, just it's like fire and forget once it's in place. And now we also have a, a little remote control that you can um, plug it into and you can put the remote control Velcro on the side of your control box. So if you're stopping the press for any reason, you can switch it off. You can just, yeah, I'll switch it off and so you can move the pallets around manually. So we can do that as well. So it's 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 just um, one of those things that just um, just speeds up the whole process. I think, is there a video on this page? It used to be a video. I, there's a, there's probably, I can send you a link to a video um, of it working. It's, um, we have a video on it. So it's... Um, it's just a, there's three machines that we base off this, this format. We have the, um, we have the uh, T-TAC, which is the, it sprays this, the starch adhesive inside the shirts. So it opens the shirt up and you can spray starch. So if you don't all over printing, you have to print the two, you have to hold the two sides stable because you're gluing the back of the shirt down. So it keeps it stable when you're printing. We also make something, and this one's quite a, a restricted market, but we've sold a lot of these machines. It's a, a decrease. And it 
goes it sprays a fine mist just of water literally with a conditioner in it we put a fabric conditioner in there around the edge of the pallet you set the arms up to where they are and it gets rid of the squeegee marks so when the, when the shirt goes in the dryer that little bit of moisture steams in the dryer and it gets rid of the crease in the shirt so instead of having you know if you do if you're doing pop straight to straight to shelf with your products if you're shipping them out they put them on the shelves no one likes those creases when they hang them up so that was the company in salt lake asked us to develop those for them and we did and we you know we sold them they, they're running about eight of them to this day and we've probably sold um i've got like i probably sold about 40 or 50 of those those are the smallest one of the of the, the uh series but the the quick call we got thousands over the years out there so well, there you go you're still looking at the website i am <laughs> i know I can see that from here. <laughs> now we, 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 I mean, we're, we're, a, we're a specialty company. I mean, I'm at my, my background, I'm an engineer. Um, I was, um, I was, a, uh, I was an aerospace. one of those things. I was an aerospace engineer. Um, um, very young. I mean, I graduated uh, with a mechanical engineering degree when I was 19. So I had, a master, I had a bachelor's in mechanical engineering and I worked for British Aerospace and they actually paid me salary from the age of 16. So I worked in their facility, you know, you know 6,000 employee aircraft factory. And I went to school two days a week and, uh, and one night and it was, a, it was hard for, for, you know, three and a half years. I mean, it was quite the workload because I was expected to deliver while I was working. I was working at 16 years old. We're, tra we're traipsing through different departments, everything from actual production stuff for about six months to then six months in every aspect of the design and from furnishings to structural to everything. And meanwhile, I'm going to school as well. So I then I continued to work in for two years and then I moved to America. I had a job with an airline, Pacific Express. Yeah, I was going to be a senior ground support engineer at 21 years old. And um, I accepted the job. They were going to pay me, I think, at the time. I think it was like, this is 82, 60,000 and give me a car. And they were going to give me, like, you know, a housing allowance for like four months. And up in, but I had to live in uh, Chico, California, above, above Sacramento. And I accepted the job, flew back down to my cousin in Woodland Hills. And, uh, watched on the news and it said the newly formed Pacific Express today filed for protection under federal bankruptcy chapter 11. I'm like, what? Didn't they just hire me? And so here I was stuck in America without a job. <laughs> so, Where'd you come from? Um, I came from the UK. I was, in, um, I was born in London, but lived uh, kind of north in the country. Kind of, it's very similar. I live on the West Coast. I'm about 40 miles north of Los Angeles. I kind of lived the same place in England about 30 miles north of London. So it was just in the country. It's a little bit nice. I'm in Thousand Oaks in California, which is a really nice area. And so uh, the office, our office, we have a manufacturing plant in Georgia, Conyers, Georgia, and also in Santa Barbara, which is an enigma being a chemical company in Santa Barbara. But, so do you ever get to the Georgia plant? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'm out there. I mean, not much the last two years, but uh, I'm out there three or four times a year for, either transiting to a European trade show, I will always stop there because I take a couple of the people from um, Georgia will come with me often to the trade shows because I use them on the booth or um, if we got meetings out there. It's Look, you can see that facility behind me, the, the picture. It's, it's a pretty big facility. I mean, we got 25,000 square feet in that building. We got 5,000 in the upper building. We've got six acres. We've got four docks. We... It's a great facility. It's in Conyers, right? We've got in Santa Barbara. Charlie, you ever been to Santa Barbara to our place? I'm, I'm not to your place. I've been okay. to Santa Barbara. I know you've been to Santa Barbara. Okay, so we've got. Yeah, but we met on the boardwalk. Oh, there. The boardwalk. That's right. Yeah, we a got, number of years right. ago. I was with uh, Margaret Best. Um, I got. We got a third. Yeah, exactly. Of a, we got a third of an acre. We have three thousand square feet, and that property is worth three times what the property is worth in Georgia. <laughs> so it's like uh yeah, it's welcome uh, to california yeah so 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 I'm, I'm we're half a block from the from the ocean so i think we win um but um yeah, yeah. I, I i used to be out there three times a week and during covid i've been up there one or so twice a week and uh i work out the home office or see customers and um you know i've had some health stuff going on so i've kind of been 
been kind of taking it easy, but uh, still doing my. You know, well, if you get out here and you've got some time, um, make some plans and come up by us. No, no, no. absolutely. Uh, there's a new uh, fish and chips place that is truly really? authentic. Oh, that would be really good for my heart. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you got to go out. You're going to go out good. <laughs> you know, we had, we had a, on Main Street, uh, State Street, Santa Barbara, there was a place called Max Fish and Chips. And I went in there and the guy was English, young guy. And he's from Guildford. I said, I, said I, I was born 15 minutes from Guildford. And the best fish and chips. I mean, just English fish and chips. No, no. Yeah, I always, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm, Sean, I will take you off and we'll go and get fish and chips. But I will make the statement right now. And it's a little bit obnoxious. Um, the, the worst fish and chips in England are probably still better than the best fish and chips I've had in America. But with that exception, I Max Fish and Chips was like English style fish and chips. And it was the most fabulous place for lunch. And so we would grab food to go. And and it was just, oh, you want to get Max? You have to get Max. You want to get Max? You have to get Max. And then after about three months, I went, yeah. <laughs> um, maybe we should stop eating at Max. And uh, he, he, he went out of business after two years. But I have his recipe. Oh, I wow. found his recipe because he was, on, he was on one of those food, food network shows. I think um, it might have been... Um, um, What's his name? Fieri, uh, diners, drive-ins, and yeah. uh, what's his name? Uh, but I think he went there, and the recipe was online. I got his recipe, and I actually can do a now pro, using his recipe a pretty mean fish and chips. And I've learned some of the tricks. And we actually once cooked when we were away in the RV for about twenty people, and I had outside two fryers going, chafing dishes, and everything. And I actually cooked um, fish and chips for like uh, twenty people, and it's pretty damn good. So, so yeah. I will I will take you up on that, Sean. Um, and you're up in Alpharetta, you said, right? Yeah. Okay. How far is that from Conyers? It's about. Uh... That's uh, depending on if um, everybody has accidents on the way. Yeah. Uh, okay. It's usually about 45 minutes. 45 minutes. Yeah. I'd say it's under. Yeah. Should be under an hour. Uh, yeah. I think uh, Randy that uh, runs our operation out there for, in for Techmore, he uh, he's a big disc golfer. I think he goes up there for some disc golfing because he's uh, he's on the pro circuit or the senior circuit now. So. <laughs> yeah, there, so. so that's cool. That's you cool. better so, throw those discs while he can, yeah, no <laughs> because kidding. the next thing goes his shoulder and then back. And oh, well, he's already yeah, he's already feeling. It. I mean, he's he we we actually he's had uh, he's been blessed. I mean, I, I love Randy. Uh, we've actually played disc golf in the uh, Austrian Alps. Uh, we were in we were in Munich, and I drove him down there. And we also had dinner with the the world distance champion. Uh, he, he, he I, I can't even tell you what the numbers were, but he'd thrown a disc further than anybody on the planet. This this German guy, and, and uh, uh, it's it's quite the. I always make fun of it, and I always say, yeah, it's sponsored by Quaker State, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and and I give he's. Not, I hope he's not listening. I don't. I don't think he is. But but I a few weeks ago he was at a big tournament, a senior tournament, and he actually came in first, and he posted a picture of the trophy. And he said to me afterwards on the phone, he said, I was just, I knew you were going to see it. And I was praying you would make a comment. Basically, they've made these plaques and I'm not making this up. You can't make this shit up, right? They've taken Coke bottles and sprayed them gold and hot glued them on the plaque and then put a plaque underneath. No quite understanding why the Coke bottle was there. But, and it wasn't a joke. They meant they, they'd sprayed a, a glass Coke bottle, smaller Mexican Coke bottle, gold, and mount it on a wooden plaque and put a little plaque on it and a little plaque underneath. I'm going, what was what was the tiny? He goes, I have no idea. And I went, wow. I said, so really they could have sprayed an oil can gold, Quaker State, and put it on there, would have been the same thing. So, <laughs> so we just uh Yeah, but things go better with Coke. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. You're in Georgia I, too. So. I think there's I think there's a lot of Coke involved in some of the disc golf circles, but I don't think it's Coca-Cola. So um yeah, it's uh but in that, it's all good. It's all good. Now, um, Charlie, you're you're in whereabouts in Colorado? Are you you're in, I'm in Col um, yeah Greenwood Village, just Green, outside Green. of Denver. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, how's your weather out there? How's the weather? Um, upper sixties today. Beautiful yeah. out. We had we had a lot of rain the last two days, but it's, it's all sunny today, so that's good. I was going to do this outside, but it's a bit chilly. I was going to say outside. We were actually at 80 degrees yesterday, which is weird for this time of the year. Wow. Uh, so we, ha we haven't had snow yet or anything, which the mountains have gotten some, but we haven't gotten anything. Sean, do you get to many trade shows? Or did you before this all kicked off? 
You're uh, on mute, Sean. Are you talking to somebody? Yeah, we went to the uh, 2020 PPAI. Okay. Um, in Vegas, uh, did the ISS? I think the last time we did the ISS in Long Beach was eight, 17 or 18. Okay. Um, and then uh, we got a show this weekend up in North Carolina for, I think they call it the Graphics Pro X now or something. They keep changing the names of Graphics. them. Graphics. Graphics <laughs> Pro <laughs> Expo. Yeah. 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 Well, we, the last the last show um, Techmar was at was Long Beach 2019. I've done that show for 30 years. Um, we were scheduled to do, I was going to do um, Fort Worth. Did you go to Fort Worth, Charlie? I did. How was and, it? Uh, so I, I did Atlantic City first, uh, which was the first Impressions Expo since right. uh, Long Beach. And uh, it was small, although I have to admit the uh, seminars and workshops were well, really well attended. It kind of blew me away. I mean, my, I had a workshop with 43 people in it. Uh, then went to Fort Worth and it was not the size it used to be, but it was definitely bigger than uh, Long Beach. You know, Texas is easy driving. And so you do get a, a lot more people. Yeah, I, I, I had it all booked. And then I obviously, because of my situation, I had to cancel. Um, but uh, I don't think you missed out on anything. No, the, ne the next, I mean, I mean, obviously, we're, we're already committed to, as usual, to Long Beach. I did speak to some people who uh, went to FESPA. And uh, they said, no textile ink companies, no textile uh, machine companies there, none. Well, I was, I was, we were scheduled. Um, I was walking Munich, uh, uh, not Munich, um, Madrid. I had that. That was the, and it was really funny. That was twenty twenty, right? So I had it all booked, and about a month before, I'm going. I just don't think we should go. It was like this was all kicking off. I'm going. This is looking not looking good. I don't think we should go. You know, Italy is starting to lock down. They've got like 300 people dead and Spain. So I called up the, and it's one of the few times I'd bought my trip, my tickets through an agency as opposed to direct because I was looking, I got these business class seats for two of us and it included hotel and it was a whole package deal. And it was quite expensive, but it's still way cheaper than doing it through the airline. So I said, you know, we need to cancel. Well, we can't, we're, we're not going to refund your money. We'll give you a credit. I said, well, you know, what's going on? You're not going to refund. They said, nope. I said, okay. And then called Hilton. They said, no, you prepaid for the extra days because I was staying in another hotel. You prepaid. I said, well, I'm not coming because of the whole COVID thing. Well, there's no alert yet in Madrid. Well, that lasted for about two weeks. <laughs> and then Madrid, Spain locked down. So, oh. yeah, I got the credit still with that company for the travel. They're still in business, thank God, because it's about 10 grand. I mean, I, I still have credits from the airlines that I'm trying to work down. I had tickets to, uh, what was it, uh, Festival was going to be in Munich? I thought it was Madrid. No, I thought it was Madrid. Madrid. Oh, Madrid. Yeah. So I had tickets for that. Yeah. I had tickets for uh, Safari in South Africa, which I was supposed <laughs> to do later on with my family. And so trying to get everything canceled off and stuff. Yeah. It was brutal, but uh, fortunately, I, I did a lot through Hotels.com. Okay. They were able to, to maneuver it all for me, and then the airlines just give you a credit. So I'm still working out that credit because who the hell has traveled much, you know? I know, I know. Well, we're just starting now. In fact, we've, we've just rebooked. Um, we're on our third attempt on uh, this Mediterranean cruise in Italy, from Italy, and that's next May. So we booked that. And um, just looking at airfares of that right Mediterranean now. Mediterranean cruise going because my wife and uh, we're looking at doing a cruise from uh, Germany north or you know middle of Germany north or maybe south. We're not sure. Well, river, river, river cruise. Yeah. Yeah. So I so my wife's not keen on the river cruise. I am. I do. I want to do. I want to do Asia. But uh, we're doing a we're doing an ocean cruise. But we're we're on celebrity on the new ship beyond. Yeah, I'm not a cruise person. I mean, we did celebrity, but. Uh, this river cruise sounds more interesting. I don't need to have all of the. Well, I, we, we will see. We're going. We're supposed to go with my cousin and his wife, and his wife is a huge, you know, without getting political, anti vaxxer and she still thinks she's going to be going. I said, "Well, you're not. They're not going to let you on a cruise ship." So, so yeah. we, we've now we're going on our own, I guess. But but um, we're just starting to book airfares for that. I haven't done that yet, but I've got. Um, um, 
the, I was just in Dallas last weekend for last week for right. different industry, Chemex. It's uh, it's the composite and fiberglass industry. And um, you remember, we, I think we've, we stayed at a, a Homewood Suites in Houston, you and I, for the Houston show. Well, I always stay at the Homewood Suites in Dallas. Um, to be warned, I will never stay there again. I actually, I've been on to Hilton Honors. Um, this hotel was so bad, the Homewood Suites. It was oh. $280 a night. It was so disgusting. And it was... Um, um, I found out in 2020 they used it as a homeless shelter. <laughs> now the thing was, you know, obviously no hotels were booking in 2020, so they were thrilled to get the money from the federal government for the homeless shelter from the city. Yet they didn't put a penny into the hotel to refurbish it. Oh. So literally, the lights are broken in the room, the headboards are all flaky. It was so disgusting, and you know, so I um, that was my first foray out. The airline the travel was fine. The airline was fine. American Airlines was fine. Everything was fine. But the hotel experience was just nauseating um, how bad it was. And they had like children working behind the, the check-in counter when you walked in who literally literally looked like children. They looked like they were 15 or 16 these girls. Yeah, every once in a while I find myself in a motel that I shouldn't be in. Yeah, well, but the thing with that, but you know what? I'd rather have stayed in a motel, Charlie. It would have been a lot cheaper and probably cleaner. <laughs> well, the pictures online look good, and then all of a sudden you get there and you realize, I don't know where they took these pictures from, but it wasn't from this place. Yeah, well, I know. Oh, yeah, but yeah, exactly. Well, no, I've stayed, that's, I've stayed at that same property loads of times, and it's always been lovely. We stayed, at the, one, we stayed at the yeah. one in Houston, right opposite the convention center. It was lovely, right? This was just bad. So when I, when I uh, go to hotels.com, I'll punch in. I want everything to be an eight or higher in terms of guest ratings. Right. If it's below eight, I don't even want to look at it anymore. Because, you know, and the closer to 10, the better. But uh, of course, every now and then, uh, you go to a city that doesn't have anything that's worthwhile. I know, I know. Hey, did and, I ever tell you about my, um, um, you know, people always ask me, uh, uh, you know, obviously, I, I, I don't have a lot to talk about when it comes to screen printing. I have a lot to talk about when it comes to just, interesting stuff and also about um thinking outside the box sometimes you know it's my i'm a very hands-on engineer and i always was when i was at aerospace i was very much a troubleshooter i used to go and solve their problems right they would send me down the flight line how do we make this work we're testing this how do we connect this to this right so i was many years ago i was invited to come out to that have you ever been to that fruit of the loom plant the one outside of new orleans it's like the largest it's the largest it was the largest manufacturing of garment manufacturing in the world textile manufacturing in the world plant it was okay. just absolutely it was it was a it was golf carts inside you, you, you know to get from one side to the other so they had a big problem with um marks on white t-shirts underwear vests everything so so they took me on a tour and we went around production and i said well where are these marks coming from and they're showing me the supervisors well, they got these tags that are stuck on the shirts and they sign off on it. These are finished, this whole stack of shirts and they're writing on them. Okay. So when we get to their cleaning area, which is the size of most small factories, their whole cleaning area, they had a whole laundry department, spot cleaning, everything. They said, look, we got this bins and bins of shirts with ink marks. So can you clean those? I said, I don't know. So we, we break out, you know, the spot cleaning guns and, and my array of chemicals, which we'd shipped in. And I couldn't get that ink out. There's no way I can get that ink out. So, and they're like, oh yeah, nobody can get it out. I said, yeah. And uh, out, my friends at American Niagara had been in there. They couldn't get it out. You know, Scotty, had, oh, actually, I think it was Victor at that time had gone in there and they couldn't get it out. So I was like, I didn't feel too bad. I was in good company of people unable to do the job. So I felt pretty good. So I said to the guy across the, the he was like the, the VP of manufacturing for Fruit the Loom in the US, right? And it was a big meeting. And I actually even had to put on a, a, shirt, a collared shirt and pants. Couldn't wear jeans. So I I said, can I borrow your pen real quick? He goes, sure. So I took his pen and I just drew a line across the shirt. And I took my spot cleaning gun and I cleaned that ink straight out of the shirt. Well, your problem solved. He goes, what do you mean? I said, so collect every pen that's in this plant and change it for that brand. I said, you're not going to get rid of the problem, but now you can clean it. And he went, oh, we didn't think about that. Well, you know, well, there you go. There's a, there's this, this, so if you can't beat them, join them. So if you can't get rid of the problem, find a way to solve it after the fact. So just change the problem. So, you know, there's a, 
this is the sort of things over the years. You know, you and I have got stories from the years, years and years of stories of trade shows and little things like that. But that one always stuck in my head as being uh, just, uh, yeah. It's just well, I think so that's definitely part of going into any factory is uh, you're not going to resolve every problem or find a, but you still have to find a solution to resolving it somehow. Well, you, you know, it's, I've got a really good friend and uh, he listens to a lot of TED talks and he's a reader and he's, he's a teacher. He's, he's actually a, he, in, in my other passion, which is martial arts. And, and Dennis said, you know, he said, look, he said, we have two sides of our brain. He goes, we have a, a scientist and we have an attorney. He said, now the problem is a lot of people, the attorney is way more powerful and way stronger than the scientist. So what happens is you make a, a hypothesis, and you, you gather some information and you make a decision. And then you will argue like a courtroom attorney to, to stick that decision and you switch off the scientist and you won't take in new information. And that happens in politics, that happens in, in people's discussions. They, are, they refuse to gather more information. They've made a decision and they will argue it to the death. And so what happens in, in that situation in that shop is they had come to the conclusion the only solution was to try and clean that ink. That was it. And if they couldn't get that pen marker, they were fucked. That's why I was sore. They were screwed, right? Um, uh, well, I, I don't know. I, I'm sure. Right, we can sure. say whatever we want. Uh, right, there's not that many people on this. Sean, well, I'm sure whenever, but they were this, you know, I'm a, I, I, I swear. Also. But no, the, they, so they, they, all they were thinking about was getting that, that particular ink out, not going, well, hang on a minute. Let's gather some more information. Can we, have we got something else that we can substitute with that will work? And we do that in our lives. We do that in work. We do that every single day. We look at the problem. And we try and solve that problem rather than try and change the problem. So if you change the problem, you might find a solution for it. <laughs> yeah. So um, that was a good lesson I learned about 10 years ago. So gather more information. So I am, um, you know, I'm politically probably on a different perspective than you. We've had conversations. I'm a little bit different, but, but I'm willing to listen and take in information. If something makes sense to me, I'll, my hypothesis will change. <laughs> you know, I'll go, okay. That makes sense to me. I get your point now. And, uh, or, or I'll gather more information about my information. I'll go, well, actually, this is why I feel. And it's just people are just not prepared and to, they, they switch off. They get to a point and then they just, they don't gather new information. And uh, we can all learn from each other and we can all learn from everybody. And I think that's, I saw one of those threads and it said, what would you get rid of? If you get rid of one thing today, what would you get rid of? And I said, social media. Yeah, I hate, I hate. I mean, I use it all the time, but I hate social media because it's it's, so divi it's just divisive. It's just it just it's separated this country, especially and most most of the planet. You know, that's up your day as well. Yeah, well, yeah, because we, you know, um, people will see now on a Zoom conversation because we're interacting, we will have a whole different conversation than we would have typing because we because there's there's a there's an interaction. But when you're typing, people, you know, as a I think it was Mike Tyson that said people have got way too comfortable insulting people without getting popped in the face for it. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, because uh, it's, uh, well, it's attributed to him. I don't think he actually said that, but, but, uh, and he probably said it with a squeakier voice, but um, it's, uh, it's true though. So we, we, we just have to, I think we have to be better scientists and less trial room attorneys. We have to be better at like, like look, listening and looking at information and, and being prepared to, maybe being prepared to listen and, and adjust our opinions if, if, if this stuff makes sense to us. Yeah, so, well, yeah, but, I mean, you yeah. know, social media has just been uh, an interesting experiment that I think has gone awry. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, what know, was it? Didn't, it, didn't it start as a way to pick up girls? Wasn't that what it was for? Facebook? Huh? Didn't Facebook start so these guys could pick up girls at college? Wasn't that what it was all about? Well, there's all kinds of issues going on with Facebook, yeah. I guess. Yeah. And, uh, but that's how that, I think that's how it started, though. I think um, they were Zuckerman was just yeah. Th I mean, they yeah. definitely got the ball rolling. Yeah, so in a so. particular direction, who knows? Just so, so Sean, 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 you still there? Yep. Do you have any proprietary products, or is it? Are you? Do you, what? Do you have any proprietary products, or are you? Are you just? Uh, is your substrate? Is, is your your substrates just stuff that you're buying and printing on? Do you have anything that you actually guys actually manufacture? 
N no. Um, nope. Okay. We're just embellishing. Okay. Do you have a just good customer service? That's all. Well, yeah. But do you have a do you have a get in a situation? Because uh, I'd be interested to hear how somebody else deals with this. Do you ever get a situation where, in my case, it would be copying equipment? And we can't patent most of our stuff because it's just, it's just, it's just assembling, assembling equipment based upon. I mean, uh, you know, I could pat, I could get a process patent, I guess, on some of the things. But, but do you ever get in a situation where you've got um, competitors who are just literally trying to uh, copy something you're doing or working on, or is that this a difficult question to answer because basically you're putting art on a design on, on something. So is that, but you have had that situation? Well, you know, uh, one time for action engineering, <laughs> the squeezy, the, the squeezy scraper. Yeah. That's, that's a story we'll talk about another day. <laughs> well, it's well, funny because, because like my cool down station, you know, speak, yeah. to, speak to Eric at action engineering. He goes, oh, yeah, right. yeah, well, yeah. We were making those years ago. I said, yeah, after I made them. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like yeah all right and then you know um, i remember uh, uh uh rich hoffman uh came up to me once and uh I, he was talking to me i said look if you want i'm bringing out so and so i can just paint it blue and ship it straight to you and he started laughing because <laughs> so, uh you know we uh it's uh, you, you know it, I, I don't know it takes it takes all kinds because if someone thinks that they can bypass somebody and make some some bank on it they're just going to do it I, I had this conversation with somebody i think at the trade show last week um the a pattern the, the, the you, how do you value a pattern you value a pattern of how much money you can afford to defend it so there the famous story is the spork you know, you know the spork the fork and the spoon spork that guy um the guy that invented that is penniless literally because he spent so much time trying to patent it and the money, he put all his money to patent it. Meanwhile, somebody else saw it, copied it and took the market with it before he could even get a patent going. And he had no money left to go after them for compensation. Mm. So, uh, because a patent, patent is worthless if you can't defend it. Well, you know, there are other situations in this industry where people had a patent that went after those who were infringing on it. Yep. Spent millions of dollars going after it, and in the end, nothing. Yeah, I know. I know a big company who make presses that sued a, a bigger company that makes presses, and the settlement was a letter of apology after hundreds of thousands of dollars spent. Yeah, you know the ones decision. who win every time, the attorneys. It doesn't yeah. matter if you win or yeah. lose, the attorneys do just fine. Thank you very much. Keep it going. Do you, do you remember we had the? Um, you might this might have been when you had bullseye do you remember we had the the alumalite roller frame we sure had, yeah we had that from Larson, from 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 jim larson right so we we bought we we we, we uh, he assigned us a patent we bought the, the use of the patent from him and we made them and we paid him a royalty and we gave that a college try and uh, the thing about roller frames which um mr newman found out is eventually you run out of customers you get a few new customers but once it's, it's an investment and once people have got a bit, enough of those frames they're not going to buy any more um and so you know so we found that first of all we we're up against a, a hard competitor with uh we had uh newman and diamond chase at the time right the well, diamond, newman and diamond chase went after each other oh they went after, each, oh, went after yeah. diamond that, chase that that was better that was millions bitter. of dollars. Yeah, bitter. Now, Diamond Chase even exists. They don't exist anymore, do they? Diamond yeah, Chase. You know, no one ever heard the, the end, end situation between Newman yeah. and Diamond Chase. Yeah, well, well, but I mean, I mean, Newman is a fraction of the size it used to be. Diamond Chase, I don't think it exists anymore. No, it the, doesn't. The, the Illuminite roller frame, we ran it for about 10 years. I couldn't even give you numbers. We sold a lot. I know, probably about eight years. And we sold a lot, but it wasn't enough. And eventually, we just gave the patent back to the loss and we said we, we reassigned it back to you we don't want it and they appreciated it he understood and jim went on and i'm still very good friends with the larsons they went on to make some great products some innovative products and, now, yeah. i love their new i love their easy frames yeah and i think that easy. that's probably the best thing on the market yeah. right now yeah. yep in terms yeah, you know, of, i used, I used uh, to get you're, you're gonna hate me for this charlie because i'm uh this probably goes against a lot of stuff you teach but 
I used to like going, you know, a tension mention. I said, you've got a tight screen. You're probably going to be all right. I said, it gets, it gets so scientific. It gets to a point where, you know, I could feel a screen go. That screen feels pretty tight. That'll be good. It feels a bit sloppy. That's going to be sloppy. And, uh, and that's when I was selling frames. And I used to have the tension meter and everything. I had a really lovely Tetco meter and then it got stolen off the booth at Long Beach by these gang banging looking guys took my tension meter and I chased them, couldn't find them. But um, but then we, I didn't buy another meter. I used to go, yeah, this feels pretty tight. I used to, that was my tension meter. That feels pretty tight. And uh, we used to do that's that. Because you're and not I, a printer. That's I know. Right. You, I know. What I used to say, <laughs> you know what I used to say, I am going to swear now. I'm going, come on, it's just fucking paint on a piece of cloth. <laughs> so I used to get really pissed people off. But you know, it's uh, I that would be like me. Uh, that'd be like someone telling me that you know all martial arts are the same and. Yeah, what the hell is this on the other? You know, that would be. Uh, I go, well, they're actually not all the same, but anyway. Um, so I get it, but uh, yeah, the, the the patterns are an interesting thing uh, because uh, I two patterns I've got, and uh, really I've never had to defend them, and I, there's never been anybody that I could defend them against. So it's like, what well, you know, it's like, so I, I I stopped patenting stuff. It was an expensive process, and um, right. it didn't do <clears throat> any good. I didn't sell any more product because it was patented. I think that's always the biggest thing is, you know, if you're going to patent it, what do you stand to make? Yeah, that, that's just it. What's that, at the end of the day, are you better off just taking that money on marketing and selling the product? And that's what we've always done now. We just market the products and we sell them because, to be honest with you, it's uh, just, uh, if you give, you know, we're, 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 we, we are just a customer service-based company. We take care of our customers. I give away product rather than, than upset somebody. I, I, I deliver my product whenever I can. I we warranty it. We take care of it. We don't, we want people to be happy. You, you know, and I'm sure, I'm sure Sean knows. Yeah. One c complaint is, is better than a hundred, is worse than a hundred compliments. Yeah. You know? So, you know, the, 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 the way out, you know, they trade off. So, so, you know, compliments are great, but you get one complaint out there and that could be so damaging. So we, yep. we just go out of our way to help people. And uh, it stood us well over the years. It stood us well. I mean, I mean uh, we've been, friends for 30 something years i guess and uh I'm, yeah it's been, it's been, I, I lost track yeah i know I'm, 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 I'm old now i never used to be i used to be and you're, young. and you're considerably younger than i am i know yeah but i used to be young i, I feel you know my brain is still young when my body but my body well, i feel the young. same way my brain is although i think it may be losing it as well i'm not sure because well, the hard drive fills up you can't you got to get something out to get something else in so i can't you know and then it's amazing how we can recall stuff from 30 years ago, but I can't remember what I had for breakfast. I'm in the midst of writing a book based on that, of my uh, years in the industry. I can't tell you what I did a week ago, but I can tell you what I did 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And um, one of these days I'm going to actually get it finished and publish the damn thing. You know, um, um, Pete, uh, Michael Best, Margaret Best's husband, uh, uh -huh. Michael, Michael wrote a book. He did. I think he wrote the book more as a exercise of self-achievement. He he took writing classes. He wanted to be a writer when he retired. So he wrote a book. He sent me a copy of it. I got it somewhere. It's uh, it was the um, um, it, it's how to uh, it's it's about the screen printing business. Just about being in business. It wasn't okay. about screen printing. It was about being in business. I'm trying to find the. Uh, uh, I know my bookshelf. Anyway, so he writes this book and he he has a collection of stories and, and I I sent him he was talking about customers and I sent him this story and I'm and I'm sure Charlie and Sean you've you've had customers that are just completely nuts, all right. But I have one customer and I'll try and remember to have a conversation. He called me up and he said, uh, I need to talk to you about my spot cleaning gun. I said, Yeah, what's up with it? Now Someone calls out the spot cleaning gun, it's broken. Our warranty is one year parts, or one year parts lifetime of service. Got someone's, someone's had a gun for three, send it back to me. I normally fix it for free, put parts in it, and send it back to me. I just, just, I'd rather have the gun working. I said, What's wrong with it? He goes, Well, it's not working. I said, Well, what's wrong with it? Well, I went to use it the other day. I'm going to be honest with you. I said, Okay, rather than lying, that's always better. He goes, uh, <laughs> it, was, it didn't work. And I was so angry. I threw it on the floor and I smashed it into pieces. What can you do for me? I said, recommend anger management. I don't know. What do you want me to do for you? Right? And the guy's like, well, you have to fix it. Look, talk to my guy. 
And the guy gets on the phone. He goes, hello. I said, yeah, your boss was just talking to me about his gun. He goes, yeah, he threw it on the floor and smashed it. It's all broken. I said, uh, okay. He goes, well, what do you want from me? I said, well, your boss put you on the phone. So the guy calls me. He gets back on the phone. And he goes, well, are you going to fix the gun? I said, you just said you smashed it to bits. I said, no. And he goes, well, will you, you've got to give me a deal on a new one. I said, I haven't got to do anything. He goes, well, should I call one of your dealers? I said, yes. He should, he should, should I tell him what happened? I said, everybody needs to laugh, so go ahead and tell them, right? I get a phone call from a dealer, and they said, thank you very much for sending us that idiot. <laughs> they, <wouldn't, laughs> they said, he's asking us to give him a gun at half price because he broke his gun. <laughs> so customers, yeah, we deal with customers, and uh, we go out the way, but sometimes it's just, uh, you know, it's... Uh, um, you can only help people so much, right? Well, we all, we all have some of those. Yeah. Yeah, it's been the days. Yeah. So, you know. Some things you can't get around. You can't. You can't. Charlie, what's the, uh, what's the deadest trade show you've ever been to? The deadest? Yep. I, I can remember the deadest show I've ever been to. The deadest trade show. So I did one for the Press Magazine out in... Um, wasn't the Meadowlands in New Jersey. And I, I was I was uh, brought out there to do some seminars. So I had three seminars I was going to do. Let me tell you what my attendance was. Zero, zero, <laughs> and zero. Now, that wasn't bad because some of the people had one show up. So they had to actually do their seminar. <laughs> I'm serious. It was like... <laughs> I, did, I did in Tampa... They asked me to do a seminar. Now, okay, seminar. Okay, C-spot, spot cleaning gun, spot gone. So I'm not going to do a seminar on spot cleaning guns, right? So, and we didn't have the adhesives back then. So I said, they said, well, what would you do? I said, how about if I do it on chemical safety and understanding MSDSs? That was before SDS, MSDSs. Great. So impressions, they're going to pay me $250 for doing this seminar. Right. My time slot, my time slot, was Sunday morning at 8.30. Oh, wonderful time. Everybody's hungover and still in bed. Three people showed up. Two left, one fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they came in and but they went did. like this. No, they came in and went like this. And they went like this, held up the microphone, like, because they were recording it. So I had to keep doing a seminar with my slot, with my, I, I had an overhead projector, with all my slides, and I had to do a seminar. And um, that was the hardest hour but, the, but it wasn't a bad show. The worst show I ever went to was a press show, Indianapolis. They did an indie okay. show. And on the, it was, a, it was a Saturday, Sunday. It was two days. Maybe it was Friday, Saturday. But anyway, so on the second day, the total attendance outside of exhibitors was seven. I'll tell you what. I don't know if the Meadowlands had that. Nobody could find the convention yep. center in the Meadowlands. <laughs> <laughs> we so people, mean, people were giving away little phone balls and we were seeing how straight we could bowl them down the aisle and keep them in the aisle how far we could do it yeah so, no i mean i i've done some that were um fairly low in attendance the one in the meadowlands to this day i don't know if anyone showed up to be honest with you the only thing we got out of it was it was just outside of new york i was there with uh, eliza cross and with uh laura fallback and the rest oh, of that yeah. team and so uh, every afternoon at about three or so, we'd all get into a car or, or on a bus and just go into Manhattan and have a good time and come back. But there was nothing there. I mean, you know, it was that, it took me forever to find the damn convention center. And I, I grew up in New York and I couldn't find right. it. We, we but, did a show, uh, we, we, one of the festivals we did, and it was a Munich show, was uh, the busiest show I've ever been to. And literally, we, we take a lot of inventory for these international trade shows. Um, we have a lot of, uh, um, we took, we, you know, uh, we put a lot of, uh, because we're going to Europe, we're shipping a crate and I've got dealers that will take my stuff. Right. You know, they basically, they pay, they pay regular price for it, but they get it freight free. So they're just thrilled right. to take it. So we take, we, we normally take like 30 or 40 spot cleaning guns. We take extra chemical, we take everything, right? Well, we had a crowd around our booth on the last day like aisle depth all the way around us. He couldn't, couldn't breathe. And literally 
people were throwing money euros at us they were just throw, i mean literally handing me euros to get stuff okay and so and you, you know when someone hands you a 500 euro note how do you know it's real i, I, I totally understand yeah so, so yeah at that time that was about 700 dollars, right so I'm, I'm going what the hell do i so we take all this stuff and the, 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 this is no lie at all right so i take all this cash we had a, a wad of euros by the time I was done, I had like something like 20,000 euros, everything from 50s to 100s to 20s, whatever. Had all this stuff, right? So um, we get to Munich Airport and there's an American Express um, Bureau de Change, right? Now, if you're an American Express card holder, you didn't pay commission, right? So I said, Can you change this for dollars? And they're calling my flight. The guy goes, Yeah. So he puts his rear counter and then they're calling my flight and he starts counting me out fives and tens in dollars. I went, <laughs> well, I'm going, what are you doing? He goes, well, that's all I got. I said, no. I said, I got it. He goes, well, I've already, I've already, I've already started transaction. I can't stop it now. So I end up with a thicker brick of dollar bills than I had of the euros. Right. So, cause if I do it in the UK, you pay rate of exchange twice. You pay to go from euros to pounds, pounds to dollars. If you do it yep. in Europe, you can go straight to dollars. Right. So, so, I end up with this giant thick brick of fives, tens, twenties, no hundreds. So I, I had to go and buy a fanny pack. Now I've got this fanny pack around me with stuffed full of these bills. And we're on a double-decker bus tour of London. I'm showing, you remember Nick, my partner Nick passed away, showing Nick and, and Randy around London. And we're on, um, I think it was Reading Street. And I look down and I see an American Express office. I go, oh, jump up, we got the double record bus tour. Go running in there. I said, I need you to change this for $100 bills. They said, we can't do that. We don't do that. We're not, we don't get, change your notes up. And I threw the receipt down from Munich Airport, American Express. I went, well, your bloody company in Munich gave me all these bills. I want $100 bills. And they go with the step back. And then they counted them all out and gave me $100 bills. <laughs> so it was a, that was a, that was a busy frigging show though. That was a, I think over the five days, they had like 60,000 people come through that show. Wow. Just phenomenal. That's when uh, Big Blue had literally half a hall. Um, and um, that's when um, Rich had the Baja uh, truck, when they were running the truck in the Baja races, that team. And they had the, uh, the, the giant display on their booth with all the giant video screens of the truck racing through the Baja and everything. I so never got to, I never got to play with that or see it. Um, yeah, before. so that was yeah, that was a uh, that's some memories. Yeah, you know, it's amazing when I got I got asked to do the uh, a show called uh, FIBO in Cologne about I guess it's about four years ago now, and uh, it's a fitness expo. Okay, and it's the biggest in the world. So I'm doing dips and sprays and stuff and i'm down where all the workout people are they had a quarter of a million people show up wow i've never seen when i when i was at the top of like the uh, escalator looking down you couldn't find floor it was just heads so what were you, why, why were you there what were you doing uh, well i i it's owned by uh the uh show is owned by reed and i also okay. do the um uh, Oh, what's the show in January? Um, the PSI show. Okay. Okay. And so the woman who was running PSI was then moved over to this FIBO show. And she said, you know, I think it'd be kind of fun to have somebody who's just doing t-shirts downstairs. And I said, hey, you know, not a problem. I like, I have no problem with Cologne, especially in May. I think, you know, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's a nice place. And like so uh, she said, yeah, come on out, you know, ship your stuff over and We'll set you up downstairs. They set me up where they do all of the dance and all the music and stuff. My ears rang for days, man. It, it was from 9 a.m. till 6 p.m. The fucking music never stopped and my ears were dying. But, uh, and, and they had everything set up. Zuba was there. They had uh, doing workouts in the water. They had it with these bouncy things. And it's like, you ever want to feel out of shape you need to be at a show like that because I mean I'm looking at myself saying I don't belong here. L less lesson learned: never never complain at a trade show about entertainment. You got to be real careful. So there was a booth and they had these mimes on the booth, and they were they were walking around and they were 
they were interacting with the people in the aisles and they would kind of while you're talking to people they would interact which was really annoying okay because you're trying to talk to a customer and all of a sudden you're getting distracted but bob drake performance screen supply he had a booth and these mimes were kept coming over because they were the, like two booths away so he complained well these mimes then he became their victim for the whole show <laughs> 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 these mimes would come up and go their mimes and they'd be going Shh. like 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 making like like don't talk around bob all right and then don't talk about bob and they're standing like this they'd all be standing there and, and eventually bob goes those mother <laughs> they haven't left me alone all day so you shouldn't have complained <laughs> yeah you know i i even uh, told uh Zilka was the name i said listen i'd love to do your show again can you put me upstairs where the garments are as yeah. opposed to downstairs where everybody's going ballistic. Yeah, yeah. I, I got to go pretty soon, but the the the, uh, the funniest open house I ever did, um, we used to do the Wild Side North up in uh, Slippery Rock, Slippery Rock, Pennsylvania. They just actually just got sold. So uh, um, they someone else bought a nice company. But so we used to do the, and, and everybody that was at the open house was supposed to do a seminar. Again, Simon doing a seminar is a bit stupid. I've probably got more to talk about now. We've got enough with the adhesive technology and stuff we could talk about that but back in the day you know, so. so i was relatively new in the martial arts it was like a secondary third degree i can't remember whether so and they used to get like about one of the best open houses ever they used to get like 100 people a day in there and they used to set up a they had a, a green room for the exhibitors we had our own room with a bar a meal and everything so we used to get smashed most nice. of the time we were pretty hammered during the open house you know because the seminars would be an hour hour and 15 minutes so we'd have some downtime yeah. i remember jerry shard was there and we we warmed up the crowd and i said i'm going to come through the curtain behind with a sign i want to hold it up i got the whole crowd going jerry 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 <laughs> and he's like what the hell right so i taught a self-defense seminar okay and it was the most well-attended seminar at their open house there happened to be a couple of guys that did martial arts in there that came out and UK for me, so I got to throw them around a bit. And it was a street smart self-defense. And then I was invited back the next year specifically to do the self-defense seminar. Impressions got to hear about it, so I did one for the staff of Impressions. <laughs> so it was, uh, I'm going, well, I've got, I've got a, a second future in this industry. I can become the uh, close quarter self-defense. As a speaker, huh? As a speaker. Yeah. So as a speaker, I was doing self-defense seminars. No, sure I used to when I had bullseye, we used to do seminars. We would get serious amounts of people. We'd get anywhere from about three to four hundred, maybe even five hundred. I remember. People. I remember. I remember. Yeah. You know, it was. Uh, but I had great speakers. I mean, I had Kudre, but I also had Kaza, Michelle Kaza come. Okay. And he would stay with us, um, which was always fun anyway. But those are long, long gone days. That was back yeah. in the in the in the nineties. Sean, how long have you been in the industry? Huh? Is Sean still there? Is he? Uh, he's probably doing something worthwhile. Probably making some money. Um, which Hopefully. Hopefully. Because, uh, I mean, you know, I think our um, this industry, uh, maybe the young guys wouldn't agree with us, but I think the glory days are behind us. The, the, this industry used to be, uh, it, was a, it was a lot fresher and, and more exciting. back. It in was the a lot more fun. Yeah, it's become very... Um, it's grafty now it's a bit more grafty um, it's tough you know yeah. um you know if you i mean i've been at this for 45 years now yeah. and um certainly the early days were challenging for different reasons just because right. nobody knew what the hell they were doing but i think the mid part you know the 80s and 90s i thought were great yeah. um early 2000s yes i think you know where i think it kind of went and slid a bit is once we got into digital. Yeah. Uh, you started getting some of the bigger companies involved or corporations involved. Uh, it became, um, I don't want to say too focused, but business became too important as opposed to just being in there, and going to show, having a good time, learning, uh, buying. You know, I mean, it, it used to be, uh, SGIA, everybody would wait with their best product until yeah. SGIA. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, when, when, I mean, when, I think also when it changed, when it went from SGIA to SPIA, is it's kind of that 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 trade over because that's where you said, as you said, when the digital started to come in, and then all of a sudden textile screen printing 
the first couple of years we were all over the place then they thought it'd be better to put us in a group in an area but you saw how small we were yeah and well yeah and it's and it shrunk uh, I mean, yeah. you know we were the biggest group at one time oh yeah we were the group i mean and, and now the other... you know and of course now digital is not only the biggest but i mean they just blow us away just go to Fes just go to fespa the fespa is just you know fespa we've got three uh, four five I, I six know. holes and uh Oh, I know. Listen, yeah. the last, you know, forgetting about the FESPA that they just had, but the previous one or two FESPAs back, they took up two entire halls for just textiles. I know. The next one, they took up less than a half a hall. I know. I know. For textiles, like a, which it, was like, it was like, under print, it was like, a, it was like under a printware show. <laughs> yeah. I, it could have been. Yeah. So, you know, two, and, and, two aisles of screen printing. Yeah. So, uh, well, you know, I mean, now it's the Long Beach show is has become the best textile yeah. show in the world. Yep, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And, no and question. I don't know about this coming up January because a lot of it is going to depend on how much uh, can come in from out of country. Yeah. Because uh, in the past, we've always had a heavy Chinese group coming in. We've yep. had um, we've had attendees from all over the world. I don't know what this January is going to be like, but I'd say by 2023, it should be hopefully somewhat back to normal yeah it's gonna be fun but i think it'll be okay we're just it's yeah this is going to be a this people are going to be uh, dipping their toes in the water this year it's not going to be uh they're not gonna be swimming yet so you know the the fespa show from the people i spoke to said it was a european show period right. okay the the january show will be in a, a u.s show north america show yeah yeah well, we won't we won't get well, we might get some south americans coming out but it will be mainly well America. you might get some central america and stuff yeah. but you know it's gonna be uh, that's it's still gonna an be, easy situation yeah. you a, won't get europe you won't get asia no 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 it's gonna be a u.s show yeah. so um you know if yeah. they get some decent attendance that's fine uh i i mean it's still a very worthwhile show to do and be at but uh, it, it won't be what it was the last time we did well, it. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out, I was just talking about this the other day. Uh, I'm trying to figure out um, how I can um, minimize my exhibit. Yeah, I just don't, it's just a lot of work, take all that shit in and I'm getting, and I'm getting too old for it now. So um, just what can we, you know, how, what, what's, what's the, with, with having the same look, what's the, minimum we can take it down and have the same look so uh, you know i i here's my take on it of course I, I don't exhibit anything but um i think anyone who's going to exhibit and takes the space that they were accustomed to is out of their minds okay wow. to me uh i think it's a show where you take half the space you show what you what your top products are and you have your visibility well, when I do these little open houses, I normally have a cleaning station and a small adhesive system, and a ten-foot banquet table, and a pallet and some t-shirts. And you know what? It's quite a pleasure when I'm leaving, and it takes me ten minutes to get out of there. So, <laughs> and I put a banner up behind. So, anyway, well, it's been real. Um, thanks, for, thanks so much for coming on. It's been fun. Appreciate it. Um, we had a uh, good chat. This will be on my website. If anybody wants to hear what, all the bullshit that went on on this uh, hour or so. They can definitely tune in. Uh, it'll be posted later on today. All right, fabulous. And right, I'll look forward to seeing you in January, I hope. See you in January. If you need anything else, give me a shout. Okay. We're yeah, thanks, be for great. You, thanks for giving me a call if you're in the area. All right, Sean. Thank you so much. Nice Sean, thanks so much for being you. on. I appreciate I've, it. I've seen your name and it's nice to meet you. Okay. You as well. Thank you. Terrific. Thank thanks, you, guys. Bye-bye.